Hello and welcome to the daily current affair analysis video by Vaji Ram and Ravi. In the analyst dated 27th September, we will discuss about nine crucial topics from the Hindu and Indian Express to boost your UPSC prep. Starting with the first topic, we will first assess the viability of conducting simultaneous elections in India as recently a high level committee report has been accepted by the union cabinet. Secondly, we will analyze the Bilkis Banu case and related judicial actions as yesterday Supreme Court rejected a plea related to this particular case. And then we will simplify seven other current affair articles for you alongside providing five practice MCQs and a handout PDF for your better learning experience. So stay tuned. So our lead article is about conduction of simultaneous elections and assessing the viability of the same. Why we have picked this up as the first lead article of our analyst today is because our friends who were appearing in the mains last week saw this as the first question which came up in the paper GS2. And that is why we have picked up with, as the first topic because this is a very important topic of growing importance for our nation. And the recent context is that an editorial analysis has been brought to you by the Indian Express, which is talking about fortifying the basic structure by inducting simultaneous elections into our election cycles. And also the fact that Union Cabinet has accepted the report, which has been prepared by the high level committee led by former President of India, Mr. Ramnath Kovin, advocating for simultaneous elections. It corresponds with Elections, Federalism, Representations of People Act, part of the syllabus belonging to GS2. Now, let me take you to the basics. First of all, what is the idea of simultaneous elections? Simultaneous election as naturally convertible into English, it means conduction of polls at multiple tiers, multiple levels of the government. So how many levels of government do we have in India? We have got one at the local level, we have got one at the state level and we have got one at the center level. So conducting the polls, the electoral polls for the center level, that is for the Lok Sabha, state legislative assembly, that is for the state level and for panchayat and municipalities, that is at the local level, all of them simultaneously without the need of conducting them separately, as we can see right now, is known as simultaneous election. Now, the second basic is, is this an alien idea to India or is India the first country which is venturing into the simul simultaneous polls? No. India has been preparing and it has been conducting the simultaneous elections ever since its first elections. So the first election which happened in 1952 and after that, after five years, 1957. Then after five years in 1962, next five years, 1967, all these election years were all held with the simultaneous elections, one nation, one election principle only. It was only after 1967, when in 1968 and 1969, what happened, some of the assemblies, the state assemblies got dissolved. And in some of them, Article 300 and 56 was invoked, which called for a state emergency. So therefore, disruption in the cycle was seen. And in the year 1970, the Lok Sabha itself was prematurely dissolved. And the next election happened in the year 1971, which was not simultaneous in an election, which was not simultaneous in its nature. So now from 1971, we saw disrupted cycles in conduction of election at central level and at state level. Talking about is India the first country to do so? No, we have got Belgium, we have got Sweden and other countries which already follows. In fact, if we restore the simultaneous election cycle, we'll be the fourth country in the world to do so. So yes, these are the two basics that we have read. Now talking about this article, it has called, first of all, it has expressed the context which is the taking up of a high level committee report and accepting this report of by the union cabinet and some of the amendments which this committee has prepared, committee has uh, created for conducting simultaneous election. Then how is it going to benefit the citizenry? So this article is going to focus more on the significances of the simultaneous election. Talking about both the significances and the challenges part of it, the implementational challenges, operational challenges, etc., we will be analyzing it very, very thoroughly. So talking about the first factor, which is significance of conducting one nation, one election in the country. First and foremost is the reduction in the expenditure or reduction in the cost by the Exchequer of India. So first of all, 
why there is reduction of financial burden and how will you justify it? So back in the year 2014, when the Lok Sabha poll happened, it amounted to about 4,000 crore rupees in total. The Bihar election alone amounted for 400 crore rupees, which happened in next year. Cumulative account, cumulative amount is 4,400 crore rupees, which took for conducting only the central level election and the next year Bihar election only. Now just think about conducting Lok Sabha election at one level and conducting multiple state level and municipality and uh, uh, Panchayati Raj elections every now and then very very frequently. So this means that the average account, the average cost to the exchequer would be about 5000 crore rupees for one election cycle, one entire election cycle. But it was also estimated by the Election Commission of India that if we have a atmosphere of simultaneous election, this cost will reduce down and in just about 4500 crore rupees, the entire elections across the multiple levels and tiers of government could be conducted easily in a single shot. This will also reduce the policy paralysis which could happen because of continuous invocation of the model code of conduct that obviously precedes the election time. Model code of conduct invocation means that new policies cannot be introduced and the existing policies they are also halted. So which means the governance is also stifled. So to, to reduce the policy paralysis it is a very good step forward because only one time model code of conduct will be invoked now. Next one is that it also improves the administrative efficiency to conduct the election in the world's largest democracy itself is a Herculean task. It involves deploying a lot of personals who were uh, basically there for different departments and for different ministries and doing different office works related to improving the governance and administrative atmosphere of India are now deployed continuously into the election mode. Then they also need to create and deploy more number of polling booth, polling stations and related ballot units. They also need to manage the security personnel. And so basically the administration also gets very drained because of continuous election cycles. This efficiency can also be improved so that their focus is not on the election mode but on the governance mode for most of the times. Next is it also will lead to improvement of the internal security. In this article only it is said that in the 2050 Lok Sabha polls, about 1300 mobile companies of CAPF were deployed. When they are getting deployed to the regions where elections are getting conducted, it is compromising with the personal strength needed to safeguard the internal security of the country, for example, even Naxal prone areas. So they were initially supposed to do the security work, but again, they are also now entering into election mode. If we can ease off that if we can only bring them once in a year for conducting simultaneous polls, they can now render their, their security related duty for the rest part of the time, therefore improving the internal security atmosphere of the country. This will also be beneficial for the parties also because now the parties don't have to think about garnering funding every now and then, creating campaigns every now and then. So this will also reduce the party expenditure and last but not the least, it will also increase the voter turnout because of their increased ease because now they only need to come once to poll their vote for both the national representative, state representative and local representative. So it is going to benefit multiple stakeholders, be it the political party, the administration, the voters, etc. The internal security, etc. Now, what are the challenges related to simultaneous election? This is not covered in this particular editorial, but because we are doing holistic analysis, we need to know about it. First of all is that it reduces the accountability of the political leaders or of the aspiring political parties. The reason for this is when there is frequent election that is being conducted, they are more responsible and there is a more frequent feedback mechanism to the political parties as to what they are subjected to, as to what the people are thinking about them and their policies. So that kind of accountability check would be reduced because now it might turn into an autocratic move as they will be elected and they will be having a secure seat for the upcoming five years. Next is it also influences the choices and the electoral behavior. According to a report, according to a study conducted by the group IDFC, it said that there is a 77% of chance that if I am going to a polling station for electing the national representative state and the local representative at the same time, in the 77% of likelihood, I will vote for the same party in all the three tiers. So this will also influence the electoral behavior. Next is 
the threat to internal security. Now, just imagine that at one particular time of the year, the entire tier elections are going to be held at the same time across the length and breadth of the country. Imagine the amount of deployment it would require. In fact, it has been estimated that it will grow to 50% more deployment. About 4,000 companies of CAPA will now be required, which means at that given point in time, the internal security and also the external security could be compromised because of the heavy deployment of the forces. Then it also could be disadvantages for the regional parties. Regional parties have got regional issues, but when they come in confrontation with the national issue, the national issue may overpower the regional issues. Also, the kind of resources the regional party have is definitely less and compromised as compared to the resources that are there with the large national parties. So in the terms of resources, in the terms of national issues, in the terms of uh, their dominance, the regional parties could be at disadvantage when simultaneous elections will be conducted. And of course, there are administrative implementational challenges as well, which are as follows. First of all, it would require large deployment of electoral equipment. Imagine the number of ballot units, control units, and now what we call as the VV pads, all of them to be deployed in such a large number would not only increase the manufacturing time for them, but also would lead to logistical challenges for the administration. Second, it will also cost, therefore, higher on the exchequer. Why does it happen? First of all, the administrative equipments, logistical equipments, logistical performances have to be boosted at the election time. At the same time, large requirement of security personnel would also be required to fund both of them it is estimated that the cost to the exchequer would go above so there needs to be a proper estimation to be made as as to what is the cost benefit ratio of conducting simultaneous elections in india next are there are certain practical challenges as well india is a vast country with great geomorphological and climatological diversities which means at one part of the country there could be certain security challenges for example northeast or jammu and kashmir the other parts could be going through certain weather phenomena, weather calamities, for example, landslides, cyclones. The other parts, on the other hand, could be going through some festive season. So to coordinate the entire landscape of India at the same time and make people to come and vote at the same time becomes a challenging task. Because think about the other economies or the other countries which are doing simultaneous election. These are Sweden, South Africa and Belgium. Compare their sizes with the size of India. Yes, it is possible for them to conduct the simultaneous polls, but what about us? It also becomes practically challenging. So what can be the way forward? First of all, if at all we want to do it, because maybe the time has come for conducting simultaneous election, but should only be done with the help of due deliberation of all the parties. So all party consensus is the need of the hour. This is also suggested by the high powered committee led by Mr. Kovind. Next is law commission report has to be waited for because this panel, though it was having some of the high end members, expert members, but still it was lagging the legal expertise and therefore, to substantiate that in order to inculcate legal expertise and legal evaluation into simultaneous election, you should wait for this 22nd Law Commission report to come up. Next is public awareness is very important. This can be done through social media deliberations. And then if we do this, then India will become the fourth country. So we should be mindful of this as well. This is a little bit of way forward. Now, this is the feasibility analysis which we have made. Now, what is the feasibility analysis made by the high powered committee? To understand that and to understand the credibility of the committee, first let's, let's look on to the members, the composition of this committee. So, this committee was presided by former president of India, Mr. Ramnath Kovin, had distinguished bureaucrats, constitutional experts, and had members like Amit Shah, and had members like CVC and CIC members as well. Now, it is suggested about 15 amendments to the constitution of India. See, one of the challenges of simultaneous election is that it would naturally require a lot of constitutional amendment, because as you know, Article 83 of the Indian Constitution, 85 of the Indian Constitution respectively talks about the duration and the dissolution of Lok Sabha, which will be naturally disrupted if I want to synchronize the cycles of all the three tiers, right? Next, Article 172 and 174 will also talk about the duration and the dissolution of the state legislative assemblies, which of course will be uh, changed as well or disrupted as well if you want to synchronize. So, 
constitutional amendments need to be made over here. Also, we need to establish a process as to how the synchronization and conduction of simultaneous polls will happen. For this, this committee has recommended induction of Article 82A. 82A into the constitution so that it can establish the process by which the country will establish the system of simultaneous elections. It also requires the parliament to be empowered to make changes to the simultaneous election process. For that, it required the expanding scope of Article 327 to empower the parliament so that it can conduct the simultaneous elections in the country without taking the cognizance of the federal constituent units. Next, it also caused amendment to Article 83 and 172 so that we can ensure simultaneous elections at both Lok Sabha and state legislative assembly level. Then it also called for certain amendments in the Union Territories Act of 1963, the Delhi Act of 1991 and Jammu Kashmir Reorganization Act of 2019 to bring the UTs also in the synchronization. It also called for second constitutional amendment bill and please remember there are going to be two amendments. What is going to be the procedure of this amendment? In the case of Lok Sabha and State Legislative Assembly. The amendments that were to be made, they do not require the consonants or the voting by the states. So this will be done without the voting of the states. But the changes made at the local self-government level, that is panchayat and municipality elections, they have to be done with at least 50% of the states agreeing to it. So this is going to be the nature of amendment. Two major amendments therefore have been proposed by this particular committee. Now, here is a question that was asked last week in the UPSC mains examination, GS paper 2. Examine the need of electoral reforms as suggested by various committees with particular reference to one nation, one election principle. So herein, you would also additionally require to incorporate other electoral reform committees names as well. On this note, let's move to the next topic. Another topic very important for the day here, the context reads that Supreme Court yesterday has rejected the Gujarat government's plea to review its January 8th verdict and also to review the adverse remarks that it, it has made upon the state government of Gujarat. This context might seem a little tricky for you to understand, but don't worry, I will simplify it for you. First of all, let's read about the entire case of Bilkis Banu. So what happened? In the year 2002, there were these infamous Godhra riots that happened in Gujarat. And again, a very unfortunate event followed up with the killing of seven members of the family of Bilkis Banu and torturously raping her, gang raping her. So therefore, this case was taken up then by the National Human Rights Commission. So please remember, it was not Bilkis Banu who, who went and filed this uh, case. It was taken as a sue motu cognizance by the NHRC. So when we will evaluate the role of NHRC, we will also quote this case. Okay, so it was taken up by National Human Rights Commission and then the Supreme Court. Then what happened, a lot of death threats started going to the family and some of the members of the NHRC. So therefore, in order to avoid that, the jurisdiction of the case was taken away from the state of Gujarat and put into the state of Maharashtra. So from now, the trial will happen where? Mumbai. And this is going to be a very important fact of the case because it will, un it will help you understand the coming up follow-ups. So now, because this was related to criminal activities, it was a criminal case. So therefore, Supreme Court ordered CBI investigation. So CBI special court in the Mumbai High Court, it sentenced the 11 accused people to life imprisonment. So it was in the year of 2008 when they were given the life imprisonment. And now comes the second phase of the case where one of the convicts, after administering 15 years of jail term, would go to the Supreme Court for his release. So he will move to Supreme Court for an early release. Early release means that he doesn't want to render the left part of the punishment because this was a life imprisonment. He has already ad administered 15, 15 years of punishment. And according to one Supreme Court judgment, which we are going to read soon, according to this, only after administering 15 years of, uh, 15 years of your sentence, a person can go for the remission. So this process is known as remission, where 
a convict goes and applies and files a plea for remitting the rest part of the sentence. Okay, so went to Supreme Court. Then in May 2022, Supreme Court passed this case to the Gujarat government. Now here comes the turn of the case. Supreme Court is passing to the Gujarat government. Why? Because this, this case actually happened in the state of Gujarat and according to the state's remission policy each and every government have their own remission policy so according to state remission policy of Gujarat of 1992 Supreme Court asked Gujarat government to see whether the remission could be allowed or not and then what happened is very striking on August 15 2022 Gujarat government released all the 11 convicts not just the person who filed for the plea but all the 11 co convicts of course it caused major public backlash and therefore Supreme Court again took up the case and this review petition which was filed by Bilkis Bano gained the tempo. Now comes January 8th judgment of Supreme Court. Upon reviewing the petition filed by Bilkis Bano, Supreme Court overturned the Gujarat government's decision. Supreme Court also said on what grounds it dismissed First of all, that Gujarat government is not the appropriate government. What is this appropriate government and in which part of the legal provisions do we find its place? We will be looking into it in the next slide. So appropriate government is any that government in which government under whom this trial is going on, under whose jurisdiction this trial is going on. But we saw that the trial was going on under Maharashtra government and not Gujarat government. Correct. So is Gujarat government the appropriate one? No. And that is what Supreme Court also said. Supreme Court also made certain adverse remarks. Adverse remarks, for example, they said that the Supreme Court order, this particular order, in which Supreme Court has passed the case to Gujarat government. Supreme Court themselves said that this has been done by uh, fraudulating, uh, by, by certain frauds or by changing the evidences. So this is the first adverse remark that they made on the Gujarat government. Then they said that Gujarat government is at fault because they have been found to be complicit with the convicts, not just the one convict, but the other convicts as well. And they also criticized the Gujarat government for not filing the review against the Supreme Court judgment because Gujarat government also knew beforehand that this is not under their jurisdiction, still they practice it. So Supreme Court created a backlash on Gujarat government and to review these adverse remarks, Gujarat government went to the Supreme Court to review its own remarks. So Supreme Court recently have rejected it and deemed it baseless. Now coming to the UPSC part of it, what is a remission? See, we have got multiple tools in our Indian constitution to relieve someone which is convicted of offences. These are pardoning them, commuting their sentence, remitting their sentence, giving respite or giving reprieve. What are each of them? We will, uh, we will understand it. First of all, pardoning of a sentence means that not only the sentence, the punishment, but related disqualifications, all of them will be pardoned, which means the entire punishment is zeroed down, it is nullified. What is commutation? Commutation exactly means to travel. So basically you are changing the form of form of punishment, form of sentences change into a more milder form. That is commutation. What is remission? Remission means to wave off the remaining part of the sentence. In this case, we saw that 15 for 15 years, person has administered the sentence and for the rest of the life, it will be remitted out. Next is respite. Respite is to take a or to give a break. Now, this can be given in certain special conditions, which means a temporary relief in the sentence is given. Then what is reprieve or reprieve? This is when the term of the sentence is reduced because of certain special exigencies, for example, health factors, social economic factors, pregnancy related factors etc. So this is the pardoning power according to constitution it is exercised by president and governor of India but at the same time so president exercises this under article 72 and governor under article 161 but in this case remission was offered by the state government so how are a state government is allowed to do that see there is a statutory power related to remission as well because remission from the prison Prison itself is a state subject which has to be administered by the state government. I hope you are getting this point. So statutory power is given by the CRPC which is now known as Bharatiya Nyaya Samhita. So CRPC calls for remission of prison sentences by whom? By not the court but by the appropriate government. What is the appropriate government? Government under whose jurisdiction 
that case is being tried not committed but tried then under the section 432 of crpc one can suspend remit a sentence in whole in part with or without conditions who can do it only the appropriate government under section 433 it can be commuted to a lesser one so both the commutation and remission rights are not exclusive for president and governor they can also be exercised by the appropriate government or the state governments according to the statutory backing provided by crpc next is certain guidelines to be followed while granting the remission it has to be followed by all the levels judiciary and executive level first of all given by lakshman naskar versus union of india case in 2000 it has only to be given under five grounds first is the socio economic condition the poor socio economic condition of the convict second that it also this remission also ensures that the social fabric or the social se the, the sentiments of the society will not be hurt at large this is the reason because the sentiment of the society was hurt therefore supreme court revoked the remission so there are certain other three grounds next is seek remission after serving a minimum of 14 years in prison so the convict this particular convict because it administered uh, he administered 15 years of jail then only he became qualified to ask for remission so the limit over here is 14 years should be administered in prison now the next question is judicial review allowed on such remission verdicts of course that is why supreme court take the order of uh, and and repealed it in the case of gujarat government and this has been this has been proclaimed by supreme court in the apuru sudhakar case apuru sudhakar case of 2006 in which under certain grounds this remission verdict can also go under judicial review so this was all about the bilkis banu case and what is remission and the other relief measures of a person going through a trial or sentence now there is a question for you This is power of executive to grant remission of sentence has been a subject of debate critically examine the constitutional provisions and the supreme court's position on this issue now to assess what is your understanding on the answer writing i would like you to comment one thing what does this tail word critically examine exactly means and how is it different from the other tail words like examine and analyze do let me know in the comments coming to the third topic this is a very interesting one about project chita completing Two years. So we will analyze the performance of Project Cheetah through reading this article. This is a simplified version, so I'll be reading the newspaper along with you. So first of all, coming to Project Cheetah, the necessity was that the Cheetah went extinct in India in 1952. So then came the launch of Project Cheetah in the year 2022, and when the Project Cheetah got launched, it was funded by Project Tiger only. It was a centrally sponsored scheme, and Project Cheetah essentially means. translocating causing intercontinental translocation of cheetahs into a more natural or into a more contiguous habitat of india the chosen habitat was kuno palpur national park of madhya pradesh where is it located if this is the map of madhya pradesh this is the map of madhya pradesh it is located over here in the shiopur district kuno palpur is located it is contiguous it is a grassland region contiguous with the state of rajasthan so the expanse was good it was having the dry deciduous forest the prey base was also very good the chinkaras that is a prey base of cheetah was also very good and therefore this was found to be the best one best suited habitat for translocating mind you project cheetah was also world's first intercontinental translocation project project of cheetahs which species of cheetah were we bringing in is it the asian cheetah or the african cheetah it was not the asian cheetah it was the african cheetah the reason for this is asian cheetahs are already endangered in nature but we have got more population of the african cheetahs who've got the iucn status of vulnerable okay so therefore what is the reason behind picking up the african cheetahs i hope you've understood it now talking about the next one it had two objectives first of all is to establish cheetahs and its population in the central india because they were going extinct in india the second is to establish them as an umbrella species think about an umbrella umbrella protects so an umbrella species also protects all the other species which comes under its food chain it will be it will be regulating the population of the preys 
let's say chinkaras because if the chinkaras overpopulate they will kill the grasslands they will overgraze so there will be no grasses eventually they will also die down and eventually the prey bases eventually the larger animals will also die down so these are umbrella species they support the entire ecosystem so to promote them as umbrella species to restore their population project cheetah was incorporated next is there are certain analysis which we have for project cheetah but before that we have got a little analysis of african cheetah for you it is diurnal in nature which means it generally works in both days and nights second gestation month is about 3 gestation period is about 3 month next is it is the it has lowest man wildlife conflict cases an important fact which can help you in prelims exam and the territorial range is also very important because this will help us to analyze the success of project cheetah so territorial range is very vast 750 square kilometers for one cheetah okay so this is about the feature of the cheetah that was translocated now what happened we will understand so first of all this translocation happened from namibia namibia of africa south africa to kuno palpur national park of madhya pradesh how many cheetahs were translocated there were two batches two batches one batch containing eight cheetahs and next batch containing 12 cheetahs which means we had total 20 cheetahs now they were initially kept into the bomas what are bomas important keyword this is small enclosure inside the national park which is heavily protected highly protected so these were kind of kind of their conservational reserves so they were first of all kept into bomas what generally the climate and the wildlife experts tells us that a cheetah should not be kept under bomas for more than three months but our cheetahs were kept for more than three months and this was a problem because these are territorial creatures now of the 20 translocated cheetahs eight immediately died due to variety of reasons the reasons for their death first of all was the septicemia, septicemia that was caused due to tick infestation caused by their collarbone. So they were attached a radar collar in order to tag them, in order to identify them. So that collar uh, seemingly caused them certain kind of infection, to, so which caused their death. The second reason was habitat adaptation because they were already competing with leopards. So leopards who were more ferocious as compared to them. So as a result, this region which was having prey base but not adequately see what the reports tell that the project annual report highlighted that the density of cheetal which is the primary prey of cheetahs has declined from 23 animals per square meter to the 17 animals per square meter and the competitors are two cases over here first of all is the leopards who have adapted to the climate and the second one is the cheetahs who are learning to adapt so obviously who will be more ferocious and dominant the leopards so leopards started killing them while they were mating or at the same time leopards were eating more number of uh, competing uh, in terms of eating cheetals or in terms of uh, eating the prey bases so not only the prey bases were getting declined but at the same time due to competition they were getting killed by the leopards and also there was infection so these are some of the reasons of the death highlighted some of the minor stories of successes is successful breeding because uh, out of the 12 brought in the second batch 17 cubs were born but again the challenges were that the cubs also did not uh, survive much the other success was pavan and veera who were released into the wild which means they have more chances of surviving but in that case also one of them died so it has got a mixed reaction project cheetah and this is about this particular topic so what is the road ahead it says that because it is a territorial animal we need we need to first of all think about diversifying the con conservation across territories not just a particular state only the Madhya Pradesh state government being responsible for the conservation is not good enough Rajasthan state government should also be responsible so therefore the requirement is having interstate landscape conservation plans for creating free-ranging cheetah regions okay so there should be a holistic Kuno Gandhi Sagar landscape and we have to restore the habitats adequately and we have to minimize the risks to the cheetah before they can repopulate the space. This is the road ahead given over here. So I hope it is simplified for you. Now you try to answer this question. Little tricky one that are cheetahs naturally occurring in India or not? Now in the next topic, we will read about the philosophy of integral humanism propounded by a tall figure of Indian uh, political science, Deen Dayal Upadhyay. This corresponds to GS4 part of the syllabus ethics within which thinkers and philosophers have to be read covered in Indian Express. Now, integral humanism 
was propounded by Dean Dayal Upadhyay in 1964-1965 as his main political and social idea. So we know about certain political and social ideas, for example, socialism, there is communism, there is capitalism and above all and a better alternative to them would be integral humanism. So this is a political social idea only propounded by Dean Dayal Upadhyay. Who was he? By the way, we are commemorating 108th birth anniversary of this tall figure. He was a pracharak of Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh and founder leader of Bharatiya Jan Sangh, which eventually created the BJP party. Now, when we got the independent, there were multiple theories as to what India should come up as its core political, social and economic philosophy. Should it be the Nehruvian socialism or the Gandhian socialism or should it be capitalism? What exactly should we have? So Deen Dayal Upadhyay suggested that all of these are western based ideas. We need a more indigenous ideas which come straight from our Rig Vedas and Upanishads. So he called for creating integral humanism which means a kind of social economic political philosophy which keeps human and all the related aspects of human in the center stage across this political theater. It will eventually lead to development of all the four aspects which I'm going to talk about. So the four aspects are known as Purusharth. Purusharth, that which adds the meaning to life of a man, comprises of four things. Dharm, Earth, Kam and Moksha. To attain all of them and not just the moksha because India was initially thought of to be only spiritual in nature, not taking care of the dhar, mart and kam aspects. Deen Dayal Upadhyay said that we should be creating economic political philosophies which are catering our earth aspects, our religious dharm, rule of law, conduct aspects, our kam aspects and also eventually leading to our moksha. So all of them should be integrated into the philosophy that is what is propounded by Deen Dayal Upadhyay. To get a better understanding, can we compare it with Nehruvian socialism? Yes. Deen Dayal Upadhyay says that in the aspect of business, there should be limited intervention of state. There should be encouragement of the private investments, entrepreneurship, equal incentives for all. Since the recent government is following already the philosophy of his founding father, Deen Dayal Upadhyay, you can see these elements in the functioning of recent government. Nehru's, Nehruvian socialism on the other hand, hand says that there should be a tight state control, something which was observed in the initial five-year plans, right? Then, in the terms of land ownership, there should be individual land ownership in the case of Deen Dayal Upadhyay and not cooperatives. Technology is welcome, but mechanization should not displace the livelihood. So, while talking about the AI, its related challenges, AI principles, we can also quote Deen Dayal Upadhyay there. Next, principles of peace and non-violence should be tempered and they should be, we should be having an independent foreign policy which is similar to that of the non-alignment movement that we have in the current India stance and he said that we should be creating a secular state despite having multiple religion, we should not be a theocratic but a secular state with no distinction between majority and minority, whether it is a linguistic one, a religious one, a racial one or a political one. Okay, on the other hand, Nehruvian socialism says that there should be reservations, there should be special consideration for the minorities. And Nehruvian socialism also says there should be no uniform civil code. So, to learn more about the details, you can uh, watch out the handout that we have uploaded in the description box and have a better look into the distinguishment. Now, in the next topic, we will look into the UNSC reforms. What are the demanded reforms and which clubs are promoting them? So what is the context that recently the G4 country members have come together and called for an urgent reform of the global body that is United Nations, which is going to commemorate its 80th year the next one, in the next year. So it also suggests that some other plurilateral groups, for example, L69 group and C10 groups, are also echoing the same reforms, the same clarion of the call that, I, that is initiated by the G4 countries. So what is this UNSC reforms that are required? What are the G4 countries? What are L69, C10 countries? We are going to read it from the prelims perspective. So first of all, the United Nations has got certain principal organs. How many and which of them are there? I'm expecting you to write in the comments. It's a very basic question. One among them is the United Nations Security Council, which is having five permanent members and 10 non-permanent members. Now, the problem is with this membership structure only. 
So what are the reforms which are demanded by multiple countries, especially the developing countries are first of all, the working methodology of the General Assembly of United Nations should be revamped. What is the reason for this? Because there are six principal languages of United Nations. Whenever a bill needs to be formulated, it needs to be translated properly into six languages. Only then it can be tabled and then only it can be passed, which causes undue roadblocks and undue delay in the entire passage of bills. So this is the first thing, me uh, working methodology. Second is the nature of membership of United Nations Security Council. They say that the five countries have predominantly been practicing their veto powers, which is the next challenge, and have been uh, vetoing all the things which were not favorable to them. So as a result, many other countries were suffering politically, economically, and socially. Therefore, they are calling for better representation of the new grown world or the new order of the world and to have membership, rotating membership in the permanent council, in the permanent membership. So these are the demands which are demanded by whom? By certain countries. One among the most pioneer one, pioneer club is a G4 club. It comprises of India, Brazil, Germany and Japan. They collaborated in the year 1992 for the first time demanding their inclusion in the permanent membership because countries like Germany and Japan are one of the highest contributors of funds to United Nations and the other countries like Brazil and India because of their vast economic potential and geographical and human resource potential, they are also claiming that their voices should be equally heard in the permanent council. So therefore, they are asking for the participation. Some other countries are L69 club. L69 club comprises of the Latin countries, the Caribbean island countries, the South American countries, basically the developing countries, which are total 32 in number. So these are the 69 these are the 32 countries which come under the L69 club. Why is it called L69? Because when they came together, they signed a statement with the name of L69 and therefore they are named as L69. Not that the number of members are 69, it's just 32. Next is the C10 or the African Union. Both of them are same because about 10 countries of the African Union are coming together in Ezulvini consensus to ask for better representation of African continent by giving them a seat in the permanent council. Next is the S5. S5 means small five nations which consist of specific, specific nations like Costa Rica, Jordan, Liechtenstein, Singapore and Switzerland. So they are also calling for better representation because of their economic growth rate and non-alignment movement members, India along with the 35 others are also calling for having a lesser polarized world, non-aligned world where all the continents are equally represented according to the new world order. Now all of them are getting opposed by the coffee club. Coffee club which are comprising of countries like Italy and Spain, which are against Germany's proposal, Pakistan against India's proposal, South Korea. So these countries about, this is an informal group, which is opposing the UNSC reforms, which are getting proposed by all these different groups. So these are the groups which are important from prelims point of view. Moving to the next article now. Here we will understand that why the storms are brewing in the East and the South China Sea and what are the geography and reasons of the sea. So first of all, in the last few years, the maritime East Asia has become an arena of intensified power politics because of rising Chinese aggression, specifically in two regions. First of all, in the East China Sea and second in the South China Sea. The East China Sea, which is bordering China, Taiwan, Japan and South Korea and South China Sea, which is bordering China, Taiwan and certain Southeast Asian countries like Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, Philippines and Indonesia have emerged to be the hot spots of conflict. Why? Because of certain conflicted jurisdiction and aggressive claims of China on the same. In the case of East China Sea, we have got Diago or Senkaku Island. This is inhabited and controlled by Japan. But as you can see that China's claimed exclusive economic zone is extending up to here. So China claims that Senkaku Islands are actually ours and therefore it is leading to a lot of military deployment leading to more confrontation with Japanese authority. This is the first arena of conflict. The second was is South China Sea. Here the islands particularly in conflict are the Scarborough Shoal, the Spratly Island and the Parasil Islands which are again conflicted because 
China draws a nine dashed line around them and claims its jurisdiction. In fact, its historical jurisdiction on the same. According to the decision made by the World Court, which is the permanent court of arbitration, China is not allowed to violate the United Nations Convention on Laws of Seas, which says that, that a country cannot violate the exclusive maritime jurisdiction of the other countries by expanding its exclusive economic zones. But China refuses to accept those orders and violate it continuously. Now the next scene. Why these seas are important to the China? First, because of their economic importance. If you look into the East China Sea, it has got Taiwan Strait between Taiwan and China. This Taiwan Strait is specifically important for propelling the digital economy. You ask me why? Because underground this uh, Taiwan Strait, a lot of optical communication cables have been laid. So anybody who controls, anybody who deploys more number of cables would be able to grab more number of digital users, digital economy. And therefore, Taiwan Strait not only being economically important, is also important in terms of propelling digital economy for China. That is the first thing. In the South China Sea, on the other hand, it has got huge amount of hidden reserves of oil, polymetallic nodules and other resources like natural gases. And as per US Energy Information Administration 2023 report, about 10 billion barrels of oil and natural gas and about 6.7 trillion cubic of liquefied gas directly passes through the South China Sea. So the one who controls these two dominant choke points controls at least the east part of the maritime world. So if we know that China is showing aggression, what all forms of aggression are there? First of all, it is building defense related infrastructure over there by building ports like for example, Hamban Dota port, for example, military installations, building airstrips in the Scarborough Shoal, in the Spratly Island, artificial islands, creating, creating artificial island as well and pushing back against the claims of the regional countries, especially it has got a huge rift with Philippines in that, in that regard. Next is, its relationship with South Korea, Taiwan and Japan therefore is continuously deteriorating which is also changing the dynamics of the Southeast Asian powers. At the same time, China Navy, which is also the world's largest naval force, is trying to exert its aggressiveness and supremacy over these regional powers. How? It asserts its claim by deploying the Coast Guard and the maritime militia and, in, and getting involved into something which is known as a grey war. This is not the actual war, but actually threatening the enemy continuously by doing aggressive military operations. China does that. This is a kind of grey war. Okay, now, now these were the two things. The third one is that it continuously pushes its claim of exclusive economic zone onto the boundaries and jurisdiction of Philippines and therefore causing a lot of rift. Now, which leads to frequently ramming of the Philippines vessel, for example, this this infamous vessel of Sierra Madre. It was disrupted recently by the Chinese military army. And then what China does, it also conducts certain naval exercises to demonstrate its extended support. For example, creating naval exercises with Russia in the South China Sea. So this is how China is imposing arbitration. So what is the response of the regional powers like Philippines, South Korea, Taiwan, etc.? What they've been doing, first of all, they themselves have become very conscious of building their self-defense capabilities. In fact, countries like Philippines, Japan, they have uh, touted to be double of their defense expenditure by the next year. So in, in 2027, for instance, Japan wants to double its defense expenditure. So is the case of Philippines, which has acquired some of the armors like Brahmos missile anti-ship from none other than India only. Next is, Philippines is also continuously trying to create a battle of narratives. It is continuously trying to picture the Chinese naval ships that are in, in that are encroaching its jurisdiction and to show the world that China is showing aggressive jurisdictional violations. So the battle of narratives is also going on, uh, strengthening of the armory is already going on and then also it is creating alliances. So one such very important alliance is the alliance of squad. 
so similar to that of cod but this one is not having india so here us philippines australia and japan these countries are coming together to collaborate and to strengthen the military alliances of the southeast asian countries in order to deal with aggressiveness of china then there is a trilateral cooperation also a trilateral made up of us japan and south korea working in the same direction and overall us has also stressed to the fact that they have to fully respect the international law including the freedom of navigation and overflight now as we can see that in the growing scenarios there has been a constant evolvement of usa so the last question that this particular article asks is that the debate is whether us engagement in east asia is going to balance the chinese power as it does in the case of intends to do in the case of squad and india squad or will it fuel further conflict moving on to the next topic this has been a headline for today that government has advised indian nationals for the first time to leave lebanon and has started mulling naval evacuations as well so here we will first of all decode the uh, news very quickly for you so they have been strongly advised to leave the lebanon because of the growing offenses by israel especially on the capital beirut and on the southern sides of the lebanon and uh, this is particularly these pager attacks that happened last week they were actually targeting an armed lebanese group which was hezbollah now because this has become an important conflicted area important place in news for us so we'll understand the geography of lebanon now so when it comes to lebanon as you can see that it is located here it shares its coast its west coast with the mediterranean sea and from the east side it shares boundary with syria and israel and golden heights this conflicted area as well now lebanon geographically first of all what is the capital of lebanon it is beirut and lebanon initially was a french colony after the collapse of ottoman empire and in 1943 it got independent from the french now what are the features this entire small country is divided into two halves by a lebanese mountain or a lebanon mountain and the mountains which divide the geographical barrier between lebanon and syria are known as anti lebanon mountain so no brainer over there lebanon mountain and anti lebanon mountain in between of which is a fertile valley this valley is known as the beka valley this beka valley obviously is created because of a river a river which again dissects this entire region into two halves this river is litani river so where is beka valley located where is litani river litani is also the only river flowing in uh, lebanon country so this is about the geography of lebanon now the next topic is about disease and its prevention because 28th of september is going to be world rabies day so let's look into this disease first of all it can come from animals prominently into humans it comes through dogs but it could come from other canine kind of animals and also from other animals like swine etc so rabies is a zoonotic disease therefore and it causes viral infection so it is a viral disease it generally affects the poor and the rural communities mostly in asia and africa so the prevalence is mostly around this part of the world as you can see that i am highlighting now is this disease preventable of course we've got that we've we have rabies vaccine so rabies is 100% preventable there are rabies infection uh, injections which are not only injected administered to the dogs but also to somebody who has been affected by the bites of these canines now what is the impact of rabies infection in human body it basically impacts the central nervous system so how does this virus reaches first of all the virus enters the tissue from the saliva of the biting animal it starts replicating near the muscles so that it enters the peripheral nervous system eventually it enters into the central nervous system and causes inflammation in the brain which can also lead to encephalitis or fatal encephalitis could also lead to death therefore prevention is very very important to prevent awareness regarding rabies is very important there have been certain weird theories in the past about rabies and its treatment so because it was known since the time of sushrut it was known back in the times of ancient mesopotamia 4000 years ago so there were multiple theories one said that consuming dog hair would cure rabies the other said that to counteract the rabies dogs brothels should be created so these some misconceptions were there but eventually now we know that only vaccines can be a cure of it also the other cure is a one health approach because one health approach which calls for an interconnection between different parts of ecosystem the animals and the plants all the diseases are interrelated nowadays so therefore 
to treat any kind of zoonotic disease the approach should be of a one health approach because local bodies play a vital role in animal control efforts so local bodies should be strengthened with resources financial resources and capabilities in the terms of health personnel as well and india dreams to achieve zero rabies death by 2030 to establish which there should be strong surveillance mechanism this article suggests there should be gis enable tracking there should be coordination among different institutions for example wildlife local bodies state government central government wildlife sanctuaries etc and this will lead to this will lead to us realizing the dream of having zero deaths because of rabies by 2030 and the last topic is about drdo creating a 1 lakh crore rupees corpus for funding unique projects about five unique deep tech projects in india to boost its self sufficiency in defense products so research which is under invested in india has got transformative potential it was only the already iterated in the interim budget by the finance minister in order to realize this transformative potential drdo has also realized that we need to bring funds for the research institution so that they can bring good products the products that now is needed for fulfilling our security needs should be equipped with better technologies cutting edge technology more penetrative technologies and these come under the deep technology category So this is going to be one of its kind initiative that will remodel the research program for the emerging technologies. The funding will be for the five deep tech innovation projects, and this will promote what the indigenization of the defence, which is the primary goal of the government right now. Because of these indigenization efforts only, we can see a lot of these materials, or a lot of these capacities of DRDO and defence being created. in india only so we are going full throttle on the indigenization of our defense projects next the primary focus of the drdo program is to propel research in the futuristic and disruptive technologies technologies which will help us in future more which are still working in the nascent stage and they are going to disrupt the economies and the defense arena they are not even created by the other countries as well so that we become global leaders in those defense products that is why with this intent this research project is being funded now the other thing is that india is not the first country in fact it is getting inspired by usa defense advanced research project agency which is already called for a deep tech initiative in which usa is also funding such deep tech projects so gaining inspiration for the same india is also pioneering in this direction especially drdo now there are three broad contours which have been identified under which the projects will be qualified to get the funding the first one it has to be it has to be focusing on indigenization which means end to end product should be indigenous second it should be having futuristic and disruptive technology what is a futuristic develop disruptive technology something which is at the nascent stage but once it is incorporated it is going to bring a very big breakthrough in the entire technological landscape for example artificial general intelligence the quantum computing the brain computer interface we have recently read about the neuralink of elon musk company so all of these are the futuristic technologies the other contour is creating cutting edge technology cutting edge technologies is the best kind of technology available for one product so let's say in the terms of network the best technology we have is of 5g in the terms of gene editing the best known technology is that of crispr cas9 in the case of vehicles the best known technology is driverless cars or autonomous vehicles these are the cutting edge technologies one of its kind and whoever gains control over them is basically heading is, lead, is leading the technological landscape Next next is deep technology so deep technologies are those which have got deeper applications than it is visible from the eye so these technologies will not only help us gain technological advantage defense advantage but also social economic and political advantages as well for example the nuclear energy nuclear fusion energy the artificial intelligence because they can penetrate deeper into the layers of societies for their benefits so this was about drdo's project how is it going to work so first of all successful bidder may get 90% 
maximum 90% of the funding cost of the entire project but it has to initially follow the 20% rule which means the first installation will be released of only up to 20% of the project cost and then appraisals will be made upon analyzing by an integrated appraisal team. So this team will tell whether the project is performing good or not and upon analyzing that further funding will be made in an incremental manner. So I hope these topics are clear to you. It was great taking this session. I hope you will attend the MCQs and write down the answers in the comment section. Have a great day and a good time ahead.